welcome everybody. So glad to see all of you here this morning. Um, if you are able, please stand and worship with us this morning. I just want you to know I was back there dancing because like that song is everything, right? So good morning. Welcome to the, those of you who are here and those of you who are joining us online. My name is Eva Gomez and I am the early childhood coordinator here at Clinton Township. 
So, you know, I went to the store this week and um, I saw Christmas items, right? I'm gonna need Adam to stop. <laughs> so, I saw Christmas items. And it's like this time of the year is the hollow thanksmas time because everything seems to just run right together. And I'm like, how dare you have Christmas items up when we haven't even done our trunk or treat, right? And so this Friday is our trunk or treat, okay? And we would love for you to join us this Friday here at Clinton Township for this amazing time with lots of fun, with lots of candy, okay? But we also still need some more people to sign up to have more booths for the kids because the more candy, the better for the kids to go home with their parents with. So this thing is just like, it's awesome. And you don't have to worry about dressing up warm or anything of that nature because it's all indoors. It's a lot of fun. Me, along with the rest of the K-Kids team, we will be dressed up and having fun right along with you. So invite your friends, your neighbors, your family, your class, your kids' classmates. Invite everyone because it, only, it isn't only for Kensington, it's for our entire community, all right? So I hope to see you guys this Friday here for Trunk or Treat. Now, fall tends to be the retreat season here at Kensington. And just a couple of weeks ago, the men went to man camp, right? And I got to tell you, these men brought home the man cup, okay? Give it up for the men that brought home the man cup, all right? And so this weekend, our student ministry went to wild. And I had a nice quiet weekend because Cam was gone. Yes. But just to let you guys get a, like an idea of how these retreats are, Cam has been going to the wild retreat since he was in sixth grade, and he's a sophomore now. So if that doesn't tell you how much of a good time it is at these retreats, I don't know what else would be, you know, able to tell you that. But upcoming in the next few weeks, we have the Rise Retreat, and the Rise Retreat is a weekend-long experience for young adults to connect with other young adults from the ages of my age of 18. <laughs> 18 times two plus some other numbers, that's okay. For young adults between 18 and 29 who are looking for a safe space to create friendships, to investigate a relationship with God, and you don't have to be a member of Kensington to attend, you do not even have to have a faith background. This is for anyone in any walk of life that, are, that is curious about having a relationship with Jesus. So if that is something that you're interested in, you can register online or you can head out to the hub and they will help you there. So baptisms is really one of the most powerful expressions of your dedication, dedicating your life to Jesus. And here at Kensington, we love to celebrate these baptisms with you. And with that, because you're doing an outward expression of an inward commitment to follow Jesus. And that's just such a blessing. So we would love to celebrate this experience with you. Our next baptism will be Sunday, November 19th. And I hope you guys sign up so you can do that, all right? So if I spoke too soon, if there's anything that, I've, that I missed, if there's anything that you'd like to learn about Kensington serving opportunities or anything Kensington related, head on out to the center of the lobby, at the hub, my favorite people, rocking this fall's fabulous orange. Would love to connect with you. If this is your first time or if you're a little bit newer and you haven't stepped, you know, walked to the hub, please go there because we have a little something special as our way of saying thank you for joining us today. So today we start a new series called Bring It. And this is where we'll uncover how Jesus invites us and allows us to just bring our everything to him. Nothing is off limit. No one is off limit because the good news of Jesus is for everyone. Amen? All right. So we're excited to share this good news with not only just our team here today, but along with the Kodesh Children's Choir from Kenya. On the judgment day is coming, what a wonderful day will be. Christ forever is the living hope of ages place for me. On the judgment day is coming, what a wonderful day will be. Place for me. Love me, Father, when I was 
down there's a little idiot on your front right it's me bouncing up and down but uh man i i love i love the rhythm i love the way it sings but i love the message more than anything else i know a lot of you are new and you're wondering about a new church that's maybe a little bit not in the traditional sense but we hold to a very traditional message that has been around since the time of jesus is that the gospel very simply is what the angel told the shepherds that there's good news that jesus loves you, that God loves you. But what's fascinating and interesting is that there are many churches, many places where, man, you would think that anything but that is necessarily the message that they are teaching. Today, and listen, if you ever found yourself into that category, I would tell you to have a little grace for yourself. If you've seen people who have done that, have a little bit of grace for them in that message because all of us find ourselves in positions or spaces in our life where that has happened. Today, we're actually gonna be looking at an interaction that Jesus has with his disciples where what they say, what they communicated was completely opposite of what Jesus wanted, communicated, and interacted with the group of people that he was with. Because see, a lot of us, I would say, we'd be like, yeah, good news, the gospel, 
That's great. And when you come to a certain position or a certain place with God or with Jesus, and then he's good with you, and then he's ready for you. But if you read through the Bible in a version, especially that's a little bit easier to understand, pretty quickly you'll find that that's a little bit opposite, actually very opposite of the message that Jesus and his disciples came teaching. See, I think a lot of us think we need to get in a certain position or place, but God's disposition, his attitude towards us is it doesn't matter where we are with him. He loves us. So you could be somebody that doubts. You could be somebody that's not sure, that struggles, quote unquote, with certain aspects of who he is or his character, and his disposition towards you is that he loves you. You could be somebody that's messed up in pretty significant ways, and the great thing is if you find yourself in that category, you're right in line with the overwhelming majority of the heroes of our faith who did the exact same thing in their journey of coming to know and understand who God is by living and interacting with Jesus. And you could even be somebody that is completely detrimental to the message of the gospel. There's this guy in this book, well, we're not going to talk about him today, his name is Paul, and he wrote half of what the New Testament is. In my opinion, save Jesus, he's the most influential person in the history of the world, and he was actually adamantly opposed to Jesus, made his life's commitment about tearing down what Jesus was trying to build up and persecuting and even killing some of his followers. And God's disposition towards that man before he ever became the Paul that we know and wrote half of this book was that he loved him and he was after him. So it doesn't matter matter where you are. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're a person here in Michigan or halfway around the world, like the Cody's children that we just saw singing in Africa, man, God's disposition towards us is that we matter. All of us matter. But see, sometimes seemingly small or insignificant things don't matter, or at least to us, they don't seem to matter to God. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to look at a position where Jesus interacts with his disciples and what's seemingly, at least in their culture, a small or an insignificant thing to see what his disposition, what his attitude towards us here and now. But before we do that, I want to take a moment and pray. We're going to receive our offering and then we will jump in today's text. Would you all bow your heads as we pray? Father, um, man, I'm just very thankful for this week. This was a week where you wrecked me, you challenged me, you showed me some of the things in my life that... I need to work on, and I'm so thankful for the way that you love us, that you didn't just say, here's the good news, you've received it, but there's something more that you have for us, and that's what we would understand and know your heart so we can move out of this life into something else. My hope and prayer is whatever wall we've built up in front of you that clouts or taints the way that we view you, that that would get knocked down a little bit today and we would understand and see who you are, each and every one of us, whether we're close to you or far from you, and I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. So as I said, our ushers are going to come down forward now, and we're going to pass the offering bags. First, let me say, hey, if you're a guest or you know, not part of our regular community, we want to tell you it is completely fine to grab the handle of that and pass it right by to your neighbor. Uh, we know some of you have come prepared to give, and we want to thank you for that. And I know some of you would like to give, but you don't carry around some of the traditional or old school versions of finances. So we have a number that you can text on the screen, an app or a website that you can go to as well. And I do want to take a moment and say, thank you to those of you who give because our mission is able to be enacted because of you. And we have a very tangible thing to celebrate. Uh, Many of you, if you've been coming to this church for a couple of years or even the past couple of weeks or months, will hear us talk about this organization called McCrest. McCrest is an organization outside of our church that we partner with in order to help people who are experiencing homelessness here in our own community. And McCrest takes these people in and they house them in different locations. And then we come alongside and provide provide the basic needs in order to feed and do some other things for them. And it helps people get back into a normal set of life as we would view it. And last week, I wasn't here, but I was told by our staff that we were a little bit concerned because we had 100 donation items that we still needed to fulfill. And normally that doesn't happen that late in the game. But y'all stepped up in a big way and every single one of those got taken or filled this week. And because of that, there is a group of men, women, and children who are going to see that they're loved, that they are valued by people that they don't even know. And when that happens and that gives us the ability to share this good news that we think is greater and more important. And the reason our church has a reach like that is because of those of you who give and serve and are part of our community. So I want to say thank you truly from the bottom of my heart because this is a big deal to us. Reaching the needs as we're going to get into today is a big part of who we are as a church. And the only way any of that happens is with all of you. So thank you for what it is that you do. Okay. 
Question, have any of you ever noticed that there can be one seemingly small thing that happens to you in your day and it ruins the whole thing? Like half giggles, the rest of you were lying because you know it's true. Or maybe you're in that moment and I called you a liar. I'm super sorry, didn't intend to do that to you, right? No, but this is so true. Like something can happen in our lives and as it comes at us, like it shouldn't bother us, but it does. And then the rest of our day and our whole week can even be ruined. I'm mindful of the one time this happened in my life, just once, right? If you're a guest, that's a very significant lie. So, um, so but uh, before I was in this uh, type of profession, I actually worked in business. And my office was only about a three or four minute drive from my home with my wife and children, which was incredibly convenient, right? Very fast commutes to work. We didn't spend a lot of money on gas. And it meant that my wife and kids could actually walk to work or come quickly to have 10 or 15 minutes with me or eat lunch. It was incredibly um, just beneficial and, and, and great for our family. But because I was able to get home from work so quickly, I had it wrapped in my mind that dinner should be ready and almost on the table at 5.30 every night. Some of you are laughing out of trauma. I'm glad that that is healed for you, right? But the thing I always thought is I did a good job of not communicating this to my wife, right? Like I didn't belligerently bludgeon her and I was a decent husband. Like I would come home and, and help even prepare. But man, if dinner wasn't ready in 5.30, just something happened inside of me. I'd get angry and like sometimes I'd even launch into these little anger fantasies to talk about why my wife didn't do what she should have. Anybody ever anything like that? No? Perfect people? Okay, good. Um, right? But no, I would. I'd start thinking, like, she doesn't love me. She doesn't value. She doesn't respect my opinion. I don't ask for a lot. All that I want is dinner at 5.30 on the table, and we can't even do that. But as I said, I thought I was internalizing this small thing so it wasn't affecting her. And in preparing for that message, I did a dangerous thing. Don't ask a question you're not ready to receive an answer to. But I asked my wife. I said, do you remember this? She says, yeah, I remember. And I quote, you were pretty annoyed. That one cackle back there, I heard you. That was a lot. Right? But no, the, the reason I share this story is because that was a pretty insignificant or small thing. But small things can actually turn into big things. Do you know what would have happened in the life of my marriage if I had let that blow up? My wife doesn't love me. She doesn't value me. And I start communicating that to her. And she's going, are you kidding me, you jerk? Do you know what I do for this family? Do you know how I'm trying and you're upset because dinner's on the table at quarter to six or maybe six o'clock? And what we come to understand from that little thing is these things that we think are so little can actually turn into something huge. And because of that, even the smallest things in our life are important to God. The small things that we don't think are significant, the small things that we don't think have an ability to detriment us or to tear us down are actually important to God. And because of that, your small things, my small things, these little things matter to Jesus. And in the interaction that we are going to look at, we're going to take a look at where something that was small, literally, but more in the scheme of culture, didn't matter much to people, was very important to Jesus and how he reacted when his disciples were communicating that something that is outside of his value set. And to do that, we're gonna be looking at something called the Gospel of Luke. Now, if that's not a familiar term to you, there is four gospel accounts in the Bible. They're all in the New Testament, which is in the time that happens after Jesus. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four people that were either Jesus' disciples or friends of his disciples that wrote down the details of what Jesus' life was like. And Luke, who was a doctor, not one of the disciples, wrote down this account as he had gotten it from the other disciples. And this is what happens. It's in Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 15. It says this. One day, some parents brought their little children to Jesus so he could place his hands on them and bless them. But when the disciples saw this, they scolded and rebuked the parents for bothering them. So I want to stop right there because that scolded or rebuked, like I know we all have a pretty good baseline definition of what that means, but I wanted us to be operating from the stand, same standpoint. So what they are communicating is the disciples had sharp criticism regarding an act. And specifically, it was the act of the parents thinking that their children were important enough to gain time in front of Jesus. You see, in our culture, kids are pretty valuable. We go to some pretty extreme lengths to give them what they need and what they want. Sometimes we even go too far. But you got to understand, in their culture, children were literally looked at as a commodity. 
Nothing more, nothing less. Their value didn't come until they got a certain age. And the disciples thought that this was true as well. So there's this moment where Jesus is talking in such a way, people, parents are coming along, Everybody is enveloped in what he is doing. And some of the parents had a really prudent thing. They're thinking, if we can gain from Jesus, wouldn't it be great to get our kids in front of him as well? So they have the boldness and the audacity to probably take their children by the hand, seeing, I would say, Jesus in the distance and start coming into the fray, start to rub shoulders and weave their way because they want to get their kids in front of Jesus. And we don't know exactly how it planned out, but the disciples saw it and they didn't think the kids were worthy of this time. Like Jesus is having one of those conversations where at best the kids are seen and not heard, but more than likely they have to go into the other room from their perspective. And these parents are interjecting into that. So they're not gonna stand by and watch it happen. So they decide they're gonna get up, right? And I, can you imagine what it was like for these parents, right? Like Jesus' own crew, his hand-selected, very specific group of people are actually telling them not. And I imagine they got up, they started coming at them and it was loud. Hey, no, no, Jesus doesn't have time for this. Don't bring your kids to him. The master is busy doing important things because in their mind, children were little. Children weren't significant. Children were at best a commodity and they had no business being in front of Jesus in this manner. And the big problem with that is they were communicating something about Jesus, something about God that wasn't true. And because of that, Jesus would not sit, stand, or whatever it was he was doing, idly by and allow this to happen. So we get to see how he responds to them in the next set of verses. It says this. It said, Jesus called for the children and said to the disciples, let them come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. He says, I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like this child will never enter it. I think there's a lot of reasons why Jesus responds the way he does. First, communicating the importance of these children, but then the very end of the verse, he shares this thing, like, when you come to me, Jesus is saying, you gotta be like one of these kids. And what he's saying is, you ever just understand or see how children trust? Like, as parents, we have to watch out for them because their trust is so great that they can put themselves in bad situations where nefarious people could do something to them in order to take one, or use them or take advantage of them. But what Jesus is saying is, in your relationship, in this thing of following me, you gotta trust me the way a child trusts. There's nothing in me that's gonna put you down a wrong path, like it's gonna be hard in some moments, but I want you disciples to trust the way these children done, but then he also rebukes them. Jesus sharply criticizes the disciples for what it is that they've done. And I think that maybe sounds a little bit harsh at first, but I think you have to understand the context of what's going on. If the disciples have gone out of their way to loudly shout that these parents, these individuals are wrong, I think Jesus says, I need to rebuke in the same way them because otherwise people are gonna think things about God. They're gonna think different dynamics about the kingdom that are completely and utterly not aligned with what it is that I am trying to do in this, disciple, in this time with these people. You see, Jesus appears disappointed with his closest companions because their beliefs diverged from his own values. You ever see a person, a pastor, maybe even me, and I'm so sorry if I've ever put you in this position where you think that, that doesn't seem to represent Jesus well. And not necessarily because they're communicating like truths that are hard for us because we think morality should sit something different, because they're just arrogant or a jerk or whatever it is. Jesus wouldn't sit idly by and allow that to happen. See, what we deem as small or insignificant wasn't small or insignificant to Jesus. So when he saw society, others, doing that in a certain way, he decided that he needed to act. And in doing so, he was teaching the parents, the bystanders, and the disciples a lesson about him. And that kind of blown out is things that are small or seem small and insignificant are not small and insignificant to him. And I think for us now, the easy thing is to say, well, we would never. And I think you're right. When it comes to kids, we probably would never find ourselves in the position saying what the disciples said. But what do we deem small or insignificant in our culture that maybe God would think otherwise of? 
What's a moment, what's an interaction, what's a way that you and that I, that we've all lived out in our life that actually sits in contrast to God's kingdom and what it is that he is trying to do? You see, we talk about the kingdom of God here a lot, and I know that's like a churchy phrase, but it actually means something pretty important. You see, the world as we know it, it wasn't created in the way, well, it was originally created, but sin entered in, and then it became a place that we're not supposed to exist. The experience that we have now is not what God intended for us. But one day, what he's going to do is usher in a new kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and then we will find the fullness of what following Jesus should have been like. But we don't live there now. So in coming, Jesus was bringing part of God's kingdom into a broken world so people could see it, understand it, and experience it, decide to follow Jesus, and one day walk into an eternity with him in that forever. And this was important to Jesus, so he frequently and often communicated it. And one of those things is he cares about the small things in our lives because he knows what happens when those things go unattended. One of the most powerful things, I think, in this text is a man named Peter, which if you're familiar with him, you know he's one of Jesus' 12 original disciples. He actually ends up becoming the leader of all of the disciples. Jesus says, you're the rock, you're the foundation, you're the strong thing that I'm going to build my church upon. And my guess is people pretty early on knew there was something a little bit different about Peter. He was a leader. He was somebody that engaged with individuals in such a way where it would be good, it would be wise for the other 11 disciples to kind of follow him in some kind of way, which also leads me to believe Peter was probably the ringleader telling the children, don't come to Jesus. He was the greatest out there, shouting down the parents, moving him the way, and maybe the one who received the biggest rebuke from Jesus. What is fascinating to me is to find where Peter came to the conclusion on a subject like this. See, Peter journeyed with Jesus for three years while he was on earth, and then his entire life became about sharing the gospel, the good news with the world, so much so that he actually ends up crucified on a cross upside down because he would not relent in sharing about this new kingdom that one day would come because he wanted everybody around him and he interacted with to understand what it was like. And in his time on earth before he died, he wrote down some of the things that were of incredible importance to him that he learned from Jesus. And one of those I want to share with you now. It's from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. I have two translations we're going to put up here because there's two specific words that are very pertinent to us in our society today. He says this, in your interactions, in life, in whatever you're doing, give all of your worries and cares to God because he cares for you. Another text says, cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Anybody ever struggle with worry, fear, anxiety, doubt, any of those? Yeah, hands went up quickly for that one. We're on the same team, right? Like all of us, all of us have issues, have dynamics that come at us in such a way that bring emotions that we don't want to feel. And I think in the certain curse world, God made it so that we would start to feel feel those because then we could understand that that's the moment we need to address it with him and a lot of these start small and we leave it and it grows into something greater and significant where if in the beginning we just taken it to him struggled through it with him we would be in a different place that's why he says I don't care what your little thing is I want you to bring it to me and I want you to bring it to me for another reason You see, when we start to bring our issues, our problems, no matter how big or small they are, what we're ending up doing is confiding in Jesus. And when we start to confide in Jesus, we put ourselves in a position to experience him. Like, listen, the God of the Bible is not one of those gods who's just looking for subjects in order to make himself better, to grow his kingdom so that he can feel elevated and better about himself. We refer to God's kingdom as an upside-down kingdom. What we mean is the king came to serve his subjects. That's why he wants your small things. That's why he wants your doubts. That's why he wants the issues and every single little part. When you feel any of that, God made it in such a way that you wouldn't like it. So you will take it to him because he is the only one that can do anything about it. This is a huge dynamic in our church. This is why we exist. You see, we believe that when we confide in Jesus, it can start to change us. 
And the reason this church was built, established, and people, Steve Andrews, started knocking on doors, trying to see if people would come to a church that was a little bit different, because we realize when you get in touch with Jesus, something can happen that can transform us. You see, we exist to see everyone transformed, because once we are transformed, Jesus wants to mobilize us to do something in this world. You've heard me say this a lot if you attend this place regularly. I have a tattoo on my arm of Ephesians 2, which is a book of Bible that that guy Paul wrote. And in the 10th verse of chapter 2, he says, there is something, this is Jesus saying this, speaking to Paul, there is something unique and different about every single one of us that we were created in a way that as we begin to follow Jesus, we rub shoulders with him. And then we're told God himself in the, gift, the way of the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, to change us in order to make, help us understand that what matters to him should matter to us. And then you are uniquely created to walk into this world to do things that I'm not capable of accomplishing, that nobody in our staff can do, that can only happen through each and every one of our lives. And when you think of it like that, we begin to understand why there are not significant, insignificant things in our lives lives. You see, when that happens, your heart will start to change. There'll be a softening, there'll be a shifting, and what matters to God will start to begin to matter to us. And when that happens, you can't look at things the way you used to look at them. You see somebody who has a need and they practically can't meet it, whether it's their fault or not, and you'll understand you have means or you have an ability or there's something inside of you that says, I have to do something about this. And what that is, is God's heart is becoming your own. You see people who are made in his image, whether they look like you or not, and whether it's their fault or not, existing in a dynamic that shouldn't happen in this world, and their problem will start to become our problem. It's another theme that is throughout both the New and this Old Testament. It's this idea of justice. And the biblical word for justice is mishpat. And very simply what it means is we look into a world with problems. And we see people who have problems. And because we are in a position to do something, because we are in a position to help, their problem becomes our problem. Because when you look at them, you're looking at somebody who is loved by God, which means they are loved by us. And living this out is incredibly important. It's a huge dynamic of our church. I would say it's one of the foundational pieces of what our church was built on. It's why we do things locally and globally. And today I want to take just a moment and talk about something that God has called our church to do and be a part of. And that is seeing people in an area of need and not standing by and idly acting. The reason you can see these wonderful, beautiful children from these different parts of the world is because God has brought groups of people like you that said, we don't think it's okay that they don't have medical needs or food or basic education. And because of that, they suffer. And we're not okay to stand by and idly allow that to happen. In the world today, there are 1.9 billion people that live in impoverished types of situations and circumstances that if something doesn't change in their life, they're probably not going to live for a lot longer. Two-thirds of the world's impoverished people are children, and every day, 25,000 children die because they don't have basic medical care, food, and need. And we can't fix all of those problems. God isn't calling us to fix all of those problems, but I think he has called our church to press into these places in Kenya, Nepal, and India to take our little bit here and do something with it in order to see these children, these individuals have something and something different. And it's not to be the savior because we're not the savior. Anybody that thinks that we come in thinking we're the savior church and we're doing something, you're misguided and you have it wrong. But what we understand is that as God has come to live in us, that we want to become more like him. And we've begun to see the world a little bit more through his eyes. And when we see hurt and we see pain and hardship and suffering, we can't stand by and do nothing when it was within our means to help. There's this book of the Bible, it's called Proverbs. It's wisdom literature, which means this is just a really good way to live your life in this world that we exist in. And one of the Proverbs says this. It says, you should speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves to ensure justice for those who are being crushed. Speak up for the poor and the helpless and see that they get justice. 
See, when you commit to following Jesus, when you make your life about going after him, you can't look at people who are in certain scenarios and just turn a blind eye anymore. Or you can, but it'll start to ache you. It'll start to bother you when they have an experience that is far different from yours because you know that the world shouldn't be the way that it is and you have an ability to do something about them. There are many ways that we can serve these groups of people, but as we said today, we want to focus in on one. And if you've been around this church, you've heard us talk about these countries, about these children. And because of that, I think it was approximately 2010, somebody in Kensington started this, decided to start something called the No Child Program. And it's very simply a sponsorship program where we take our funds and we send them to a group of children to have their educational, physical, and health needs met in a very practical way. And rather than me sharing with you some of what those things is, we have somebody on video that we want to share with you today. His name is David. He is an adult now, but he went through the No Child program, and we would love for you to listen to his story. So let's go ahead and watch this together now. I am David Lokemer, an alumni of Kaurion Children's Home. I would like to share my story. Welcome. I was born to a farmer in a remote village in eastern Uganda. As a young boy living in Pokot tribe, my life was good and I was happy. My family worshipped many pagan gods. We believed the earth was governed by mysterious spirit gods that we had to appease. When I was seven and a half years old, my village was brutally attacked by a band of nomadic riders. I ran away to hide in the trees to escape from the attackers. When I emerged from hiding, I saw devastation and people weeping. I then realized that both of my parents had been killed. But there was no time to feel sorry for myself. I had a young brother, and now I was the only caregiver. Life looked bleak, as we had no food or shelter or no one to turn to. I worked odd jobs, doing whatever I could to get by, but long hours of manual labor and living outdoors took a toll on us. Life was a struggle. One day, though, when I was selling milk, a man passing by stopped and asked why I was looking so overworked and impoverished. He introduced himself as Luca, and he continued to ask me questions and insisted on learning about my situation. After sharing my story, he told me about school. I was confused as I didn't know what school was. He said that my brother and I had a right to get an education. But I told him that nobody was going to allow orphans like us to come to school. A few days later, Luca took my brother and I to the Kaurion Children Home to attend school and soon afterwards, we moved into the orphanage dormitory. For the first time since my parents died, I had food, clean clothing, and safe place to sleep. But something even more important was happening in my heart. I was starting to know God. At Kaurion, I learned about the one through living God who immensely loves us deeply. And it was during this time that I was blessed with my new sponsor, parents from the USA. Seeing God's love being expressed through other people developed my faith and trust. I didn't even feel like I was an oven anymore. Through the generosity of my sponsors, I finished the primary school and went on to high school. And after high school, I went to university. And I am now interning in county government. Through the years, I have been a part of leading youth camps, preaching the gospel in school, and being a part of the worshiping team. I marvel at how God has been blessing me in every stage of my life. My life hasn't always been easy, but God has always been faithful. And to this day, 
My sponsors are my heroes. I want to share some details with you and then share with you how God's wrecking my world this week. David is one of hundreds of kids who have been impacted forever because of the No Child Initiative. When I say hundreds, I should probably say thousands because there's approximately 5,000 children who have been sponsored by somebody who saw an injustice in this world and decided they weren't going to stand by and just idly allow it to happen because in their journey of moving and journeying with Jesus, what was important to him started to become important to them. And when the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you can't be the same person you were before. You can't stand by or just sit by and allow things like this to happen without doing something because of it. In our No Child program, there are approximately 400-ish some children who do not have a sponsor who do not have the basic needs of what it requires to be met. And we don't think that's okay. So what our hope is today, and it happened in the nine, and it's happened at some of their campuses in the 10, and our, with our six campuses by the end of this service, we would like to see that number go down to zero. So we are asking you to step up, to step into this with us and help us sponsor these children so that they can have some of their basic needs met, which then gives us an ability to talk to them about the greatest message the world has ever known. So this is what that involves. For $45 a month, you can support a boy or a girl which provides for their health care, their food, their lodging, and their education. As they move on and get older, in that part of the world, your education means you go to a boarding school, which means that I believe it's $82 a month to sponsor that child. Can you imagine for a whole month of living in a different place and it costs approximately 30-ish some dollars difference? Our aim, our goal, our hope is that every single one of these children will have what your and eyes take for granted. So this is my ask. If you are in a position to help, we wanna invite you in. And I know for some of you, you're not able, but some of us, we could get creative and come up with what it is needed to sponsor these kids a month, whether that's cutting something in our budget or finding some friends and coming together and sponsoring some of these children together. Our K Kids team has a picture of a child that they sponsor collectively together. And this is what I wanted to share. So this week has been a week for me. and. The Lord puts verses kind of on me in songs, and it's the verse or the song that I need to work on and deal with myself. And the verse that I have uh, been a part of, I can't think of the reference off the top of my head, but it says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and in the right time, he will lift you up. And a lot of you probably, you couldn't see this, it happens inside of me, but I've been doing a lot of lifting up of myself on my own. I'm sure some of you can relate to that category, but children with needs is probably the most significant thing that I would love to drive to end. It's why my wife and I have done adoptions. It's why we've invested in people in adoptions, but I've gotten pretty high and mighty on my horse. And as we were moving through this stuff this week, I had thoughts and ideas about things and, and I was pretty arrogant. I was pretty prideful. When that happens, there's a, a callousness that can form over your heart and you can't feel and you can't see and you can't experience what God wants to. So the Lord decided to wreck me this week. I was on uh, the internet where all great things start. And I saw a picture, a video that somebody had shared of this little boy that's in a different part of the world experienced some of the most horrendous things. And he was with a doctor and the boy was terrified because of what had been happening in his, in his life. You could see it in his face. You could see it when he cried. And he looks just like my five-year-old with just a different color skin. I saw him crying and I saw him in fear and all I could see was my son. And I thought, what if I didn't have any means to help him? What if I didn't have the means to interject to get him the food or the health care that he needed? And I was the biggest jerk because it took me seeing my son placed in that situation to understand what was happening around us. So my charge and my challenge to all of us is look at these children, look at these people as if they are somebody that you care for and you deeply love. And if you weren't in a position to do anything, would you hope 
that somebody would step up and do something for your child. So this is what we're asking you to do. Can everybody grab your smartphone and pull it out? Grab it and pull it out. And we are gonna put a QR code up in the screens in front of you. And for some of you, there's a sticker on the chair in front of you that you can see it. This is what we want you to do, is scan the QR code and it will take you to our page that shows the No Child program. Right on the front, it says, because no child should live without hope. There is an icon that says, sponsor now. I would love for you to click on it. And as you click on it, there's gonna be another page that loads with a list of all of the different children who are in need of a sponsor. And I remember the first time I did this, it was at a concert and I came down, we didn't have smartphones then, and there was all of these portfolios of children and people and you get overwhelmed and you try to find the perfect child. And I just want you to understand, there's no perfect child. Every single one of them are exactly perfect for what it is that God wants to do in you and for them in this moment. And I would ask you to scroll through to find one to click sponsor now. It will then give you the specific details about that child. And if you click sponsor now one more time, it will take you to the page where you can set yourself up to monthly contribute and sponsor a child so the basic needs of their life can be met. Listen to me. This is the heart of the gospel. This is the heart of our church. It's the heart of Jesus. And as we rub shoulders with him, as we follow him, these are the types of things he wants for us. And I think sometimes we can get caught up thinking, yes, it's to sponsor the child. But listen to me. You do this. You start to take steps with Jesus into this. He is going to start to wreck your world and break your heart in the best kind of way. I remember when I saw that video, I was angry with God because of what it was doing to me. I have not cried that hard since the day that my dad died. But what God was showing me is there was some callous. There was some frozenness on my heart. And he wanted to remove it because he has other things for me to do. He has other things for you to do. He has other things for us to do. And in order for that to happen, sometimes he needs to take the chisel to us and thaw out what has become frozen in order so that we can see the world that way that he sees it because then we'll be be able to react to it the way that he can. And listen, we're not going to solve the world's problem. And sometimes that can limit us or stop us from doing what it is that he wants us to do in the moment. So I would implore you, look at the face of these children and think to yourself, what would I want to have happen if this was my child and I had no ability to help them in any way? Two more things I want to share with you very briefly. One of these is a verse. It comes from James chapter 1, verse 27. James was Jesus' brother. Didn't think Jesus was God growing up and into his adult life. But then something happened and changed it where he understood exactly who Jesus was. God who'd come to earth in the form of the human. And he wrote some things down that are in our Bible. And I want to share one of them with you. James came to understand what religion or what following Jesus really is. And this is what he says. He says, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means this. Caring for orphans and widows in their distress while refusing to let the world corrupt you. Orphans and widows, you can translate into this text as anybody who is vulnerable. And right now, in front of all of our faces, there are children who are vulnerable. David's story was somebody raided his village and killed his parents. He did nothing wrong. There was an injustice done to him. But because we follow Jesus, when we see injustice and he is starting to change us, we can't be the same people that we were before. So we act or we move in order to fight the injustice happening around us. So I would ask, whether you're in this room or you're watching online, You consider what it would look like to sponsor a child. You realign your budget if you are in a position to do it in order to make this happen. And when you start this journey with Jesus, he's going to wreck you. He's going to change you. He's going to hurt your heart in order to do something different. Three days ago, I was pretty upset. And today, I am so thankful that God showed me the arrogance in my heart and my attitude in order to help me see more clearly what it is that he sees. As you rub shoulders with Jesus, this is what he wants to do in my life and your lives. All we have to be do is be willing to take the next step with him.
So we're gonna sing one more song, and as we sing it, not looking for anybody to stand and sing, my hope is that you will continue on your phone and sit through and look for a child and maybe figure out a way that you could sponsor them so that they could receive justice, the basic elements, and then also hear about the message of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that the small things that happen in our lives are important to you and they matter because you want to drive us into this wonderful, great, challenging, amazing, hard relationship with you. And as you do it, you will shape us, you will shift us, and that you will change us. May we be people who see the hurting and the broken, those who experience injustice and not stand idly by. May we be a people and a place that create a debt. And this morning, may the debt be that there would be no child left on this list that needs a sponsor, that between us and our other five places and locations and the people watching online, that we would step into this mess in order to see more people have something that you want for them in order to teach them who you are and what it is that you think of them. I pray that you would just keep working on every single one of us. Keep working on me and may we view this world through your eyes and then not just sit and think about it but move in our own hearts and minds and see things happen because we will. I ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen.
simple. It's the gospel message. When we see people that don't have it, we want to be a community and place where we can press in on behalf of them. So I hope that you will consider sponsoring a child. If you have questions, we have a table out in the lobby where the No Child staff, actually one of them that works in Troy, attends our campus. She would love to answer any of your questions. We do short-term missions trips where you can go over and be there with these children. Actually, David was sponsored by somebody here in our church, and they have got to meet him and have a relationship with him many, many instances. So if any of that is interesting to you, please stop by, ask some questions. We would love to be a part of doing that with you. And as you've been here, if anybody would love to have somebody pray for you, I would encourage you. Our prayer team's coming down front. I have the prayer team prays with me every Sunday before I speak, and I lay out what my week has been, what I'm worried about happening up here. There's something powerful about putting what's happening in your life into the ether, and when somebody prays for you, that is what happens. We'd love to encourage you to do that as well, and also just say, we hope you have a fantastic Sunday. Um, hopefully, we'll see you back here next week for the second part of Bring It, where we're talking about bringing another thing to Jesus. But until then, I hope you have a great week and a fantastic Sunday. Thanks for being here here with us, everybody. Have a good week.